Well, as I prayed regarding value, all of us have a value system. Uh, Now, that value system might be different for one person to the next. I might place a high value on something and you might place a high value on something else. This value system certainly came to light in our family as we were traveling back from the U.S. to Australia through Moscow. Um, Long way around, there was a reason. But uh, we, unfortunately, our youngest daughter... Uh, left her teddy bear, her poo bear in fact, in the Moscow airport. And we left and then we believe we were on the plane and we thought, where's Pooh Bear? Oh no, there is, we've lost him, we've, we've left him uh, in the airport. The value system of my daughter was made very clear as she longed for Pooh Bear. And I was just about to pay any money I could to get that Pooh Bear back. <laughs> that value system caused her to desire Pooh Bear because Pooh Bear gave her the comfort that she now lost, uh, that she couldn't find in anything else. Um, but she since has, uh, well, let's, not, let's leave that alone. <laughs> I'm likely to get into trouble if I keep going down that road. <laughs> but just simply to say that all of us have a value system and we place value on certain things. And when we place value on certain things, we're not going to place it on another. And the things that we place value on will cause us to um, have affections for that that will have ramifications in our life. Jesus speaks about the value of the kingdom of heaven. He spoke about this in two parables. He he talked about, he described the kingdom of heaven as a, a treasure that a man found... And then he covered it up, found in a field, covered it up and with joy sold everything he owned that he might attain that field, that treasure. I love it how it says in his joy, he gave up everything to attain that. He placed higher value on the treasure in that field than he did with everything else in his life. And the people around him must have thought he was crazy. You're selling up everything? Are you sure that this is just not uh, some crazy idea? And I'm sure he said, I've got, I think I know what I'm talking about here. I've seen something that is of far greater value than anything else and I'm willing to forsake everything to gain that. And then Jesus then went on and spoke of another parable of, The pearl of greater price. Uh, A pearl that uh, a merchant, a a, a trader of pearls found and then sold all all these other pearls to gain that very one pearl. And it wasn't so much, it talks about the kingdom of heaven. The the treasure relates to the kingdom of heaven. The, The greater pearl relates to the kingdom of heaven. Could be said that they relate to salvation. It could be said that they relate to the person of Jesus. And the point is that it's not that they sold to gain, that they bought their way into heaven. It was that they showed that the kingdom of heaven had far greater value to them than everything else. And that was shown because they were willing to forsake everything to gain the kingdom of heaven. I think that is a good example of what we have here in the life of Paul. Paul was on the road to Damascus with great treasures in his pocket, with great credentials that he held up. Uh, He wasn't seeking Christ. Uh, He didn't believe he needed Christ at that time. He thought he was so self-sufficient. But when he found Christ, everything else became a big fat zero in his life in order to gain Christ. It exposed the the futility of all other things that he held dear in his life when he saw Christ. When he saw the treasure, when he saw the greater pearl, everything else just fell away. And that he held no, no value on those things anymore. This passage is perhaps one of the greatest autobiographical accounts of someone who is willing to give up for Christ to see what does it mean to value Christ above all other things. 
In fact, it's one of the best statements of the doctrine of salvation in Scripture, revealing what it means to repent and turn from all else and turn to Christ as our only hope, as our only treasure, as our only value. A great exchange occurred on the road to Damascus that day. Everything he once held dear became nothing to obtain Christ. Everything he prided himself on was no longer. In fact, it was not a pride. It was a reproach for Paul that he would gain Christ. The main point of what we're looking at this morning is that only those who know Christ recognize everything else as loss. I'll say that again. Only those who know Christ recognize everything else as loss. Could be said in short, gaining Christ is only found in losing everything else. Let's get up to speed in our passage to understand the context that Paul brings this autobiographical account. Um, He has said uh, that that there are Judaizers threatening the church. In verses uh, 2, we find out these ones he calls uh, uh, dogs, the evildoers. They are mutilators of the flesh. What they're saying is what you need... You've got Jesus, but you need to be circumcised. You need to follow the Mosaic law in order to have have salvation. Have Jesus indeed, but you need other things. Uh, He's not the greatest pearl. He's not the greatest treasure. You need something to add to that. And Paul replies, and so this was uh, really affecting the church, and he replies in verse 3, Uh, For we are the circumcision. We don't need to mutilate the flesh. We are the circumcision in Christ who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. And now now Paul seems to transition here as we enter verse 4 and thinks, let me take on the Judaizers at their own game. Uh, Let me show them what they have versus what I had and what I renounced in order to gain Christ. If, do you want to check credentials? Do you want to compare credentials with regards to Judaizing, with regards to works of the law, works of the flesh? I want to put up mine and then I'll show you what I think of those and then I'll show you what Christ means to anyone who desires Christ. And so he says in verse 4, though I myself... I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh. Also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. You want to check credentials? Let's do this. And now Paul's going to go on and talk of seven credentials or credits that he held in his, um, let's say, uh, balance sheet. Paul's going to use accounting terms and he's going to say, this is what I had in the black. This was a positive to me. Seven things that I'm going to give you. Seven things. Four of those is going to be, I inherited those as a Jew. Three of them is going to be that I actually worked for those. These are personal achievements. And so he's going to give these as, as, as I guess, positives for the Christian, sorry, the Christian, the person, anyone to hold on to, anyone to build their lives on. And we can call this division uh, Paul's religious credit. Paul's religious credit. What have you got on your balance sheet that you hold onto? What is your identity wrapped up in? Let's put that on the balance sheet. This is what we're going to put. This is what Paul's saying. Let's put all that, that you hold dear above Christ all on that balance sheet. And now let's have a look at what he says. So the first one, he says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. In the Greek, it's, I'm an eighth dayer. This is like, um, immediately, my parents followed the, co- the, the Mosaic law that I would be brought into the covenant people and circumcised on the eighth day. I was perfectly, everything was in compliance with the law immediately. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I, was, I, I am of the people of Israel. I am not like... Um, those who have come in to the people of God. 
I'm not a, a Jew by coming in and believing the covenant promises. I was born a Jew. I'm not a proselyte that I've come in. I've born a Jew. I am of the covenant people. I am of the seed of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. I have Abraham's blood running through my veins. No, I am a Jewish man through and through. I am circumcised on the eighth day. I am of the people of Israel. I am of the tribe of Benjamin, even. You want to cop that? I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. The, the tribe, the, the Benjamin was the only son of um, Jacob born in Canaan. And then you know basically about uh, Benjamin, that Benjamin and Judah were the southern tribes. Uh, they were the spiritual ones. They were the ones who followed the law of the Lord. Uh, and valued God more than any. Um, it was them who were was taken into Babylon. But then it was those two that came back. Uh, they were the ones who came back to establish uh, the uh, Israel. Jerusalem was in Benjamin, or the Benjamin uh, tribe was uh, Jerusalem, where the temple was, was there. In fact, King Saul, the first king of Israel, was from the tribe of Benjamin. And guess what Paul's name was? Before he came to be a Christian, a believer, it was Saul. I mean, so he is, he's got, this guy, guy's got good stock, right? So he's from the covenant people. He's an he's a Israel, Israelite, a Jew. Uh, he's from the tribe of Benjamin. This is the elite, the spiritual guns uh, of Israel. I've got the, doc, uh, the genealogy documents to prove it, Paul would say. Uh, they couldn't do that because once the tribes came back, uh, all the tribes bar Judah and Benjamin basically dissipated. We don't know where they are. Not Paul. Paul knows where he is. He's of the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, you, it could be like you're from, I can go right back to Luther. Martin Luther, I've got the documents to prove it. Uh, in fact, I might go all the way back to Paul. How's that? A um, couple of thousand years. This is a couple of thousand years, almost. So he was from the tribe of Benjamin. Not only, he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was born in the diaspora community in Tarshish. But in the diaspora community, uh, you, you would have Jews who lose the ability to speak Hebrew. Not Paul. He prayed in Hebrew. He read in Hebrew. He, uh, he spoke in Hebrew. Uh, he kept his Hebrew heritage. Uh, he didn't lose it. He was educated in Jerusalem by the famous Rabbi Gamaliel. Uh, and this guy is, he's got the credentials on the board. Judaizers, you want to check some things? Well, look at my heritage. Can you match that? Um, and even if you can match the heritage, uh, I'll show that it's not only based on my heritage, it's actually based on my zeal for God and obedience to his law. Because look at me now. He says, I am a, as to the law, I'm a Pharisee. I'm not one of those liberal denominations. Now, it's like us. I'm from reform stock. You know, I pride myself on that. I'm not the Sadducees. I take a full literal view of Scripture, the Pharisees did. I hold to it. In fact, a Pharisee means I'm separated. I'm separated from the, the unclean people. I'm separated to the law. I mean, I am now, I'm so zealous for the truth that I am a Pharisee. As to the law, I am scrupulous gets better. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. In fact, I value God and the law so much that I will go up against anyone who tries to pull down that. He says to the Judaizers, look, you're only trying to convert the church. I try to eradicate it. You want zeal? I mean, it's, it's quite ironic, isn't it? <laughs> that, that, he's, that he's using this against them. You're only trying to convert us. I tried to eradicate the church. And we find this, that when Stephen the first martyr died, that Paul or Saul was there at his death. We find that in Acts 9, uh, Paul, it says, is still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. And he went to the high priest, he requested letters to take to Damascus, to the synagogues, that he could round up as many people of the way, that's Christians, and bring them back to Jerusalem. You want zeal for the law, for God? I am the most zealous guy there is. I'm trying to destroy every opposition against God there is. 
But as to righteousness, under the law, I'm blameless. This doesn't mean he's sinless. This just means that if you try to uh, catch Paul out or show any inconsistency in his work as it accords to the law, you couldn't do it. If he is living by the law, this is the man you need. If there is a righteousness to be found by the law keeping, you've got him right here. That's what he's saying. Paul is saying, if, I, if anyone could get to heaven by their own righteous deeds, I'm the man. I am the man. Reminds me of Martin Luther. 1,500 years later, uh, he fell into the same trap of seeking a righteousness uh, found in the doing, in the obedience, in worship, in stuff. And he said this, I was a good monk and I kept the rules of my order so strictly that I may, that I may say that if ever a monk got to heaven by his monkery, it was I. All my brothers in the monastery who knew me will bear me out. If I had kept on any longer, I would have killed myself with vigils, prayers, reading and other work. Martin Luther was the modern day Paul. If anyone's going to get to heaven, it's going to be Surely it's going to be Luther. If anyone's going to get to heaven through obedience to zeal for God, it's going to have to be Paul, isn't it? What about you? What is in your ledger that you are placing in the black there, that you are placing as credit? Is it that you've been brought up in a Christian home? You know, we are fifth generation Christians here. In fact, pastors go down our whole line. I attend church Every Sunday, in fact, I teach at Sunday school. I was baptized. I help others. I volunteer. Um, look, I don't really do bad things. I don't do. You know, I'm not not purposefully trying to hurt anyone. In fact, I you know, I like people. I I enjoy people. Um, all those things, uh, they're, they're good things. They're good things. Going to church is a necessary thing. Reading your Bible is a necessary thing. Being baptized is a good thing. But if that is placed in the credit account as something I'm resting in, then we've got a big, big problem. And this is where Paul now takes his argument and says, if a righteousness before God can be found in stuff, in doing, I had it. I had it. Now he says, let's have a look at this second thing. Paul's radical reversal. First thing, Paul, Paul's religious credit. Secondly, Paul's radical reversal. Listen carefully. Verse 7. Now when I look at all that, he says, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Whatever I had in the black, whatever credit I had. Now, I want you to know the verse, the word gain is in the plural. The word loss is in the singular. Whatever credit I had, the gain I had, I could tell you, in fact, he did seven things. And you might have your credit account all, all worked out. It's gains. It's a list. Whatever gain I had. I now count it as only one thing in the singular as a big fat negative. It's just flipped with one stroke of the pen from the credit side to the debit side. I count that everything now as loss. In the blink of an eye for the sake of Christ. A big fat zero. This tells me something that we've got to be extremely wary of with ourselves and particularly as parents. If we try to moralize our children and tell them that this is what you need to do to be a Christian, this is what you need to do, you need to obey, you need to do this, do this, do this, what we could be doing is we could be trying to build up an account that will never amount to anything. What we need to be doing is they will do the doing after they've seen the Christ after they, for the sake of Christ, after they have seen the glory and the beauty of Jesus Christ. I count all things as lost for the sake of Christ. 
Are you, do you live for the sake of Christ and then all your obedience is, comes out of that? Are you moralizing your children and saying that you need to do this and by you doing this, you are somehow affirming you are a Christian? Or is there a deep love and deep abiding in Jesus Christ? If we do that, if we moralize, then Christianity will seem like enslavement and not freedom. And everything else will seem like freedom and not the enslavement it is. We need to show them the freedom that is in Christ. He goes on. He says, indeed, I have counted, I count everything a loss. Indeed, more than that. Paul's not backing down. Uh, he says, indeed, I count now everything as loss. He did. He said, I counted it loss. When I saw Christ, all my credentials went. But get this. So he's got the whole pile of his good works, right? Now, 30 years afterwards, he says, you know, everything else, Everything else I, I've got in my life, I want to throw that on the pile as well. All the list of stuff I now throw on the pile as well. All my credentials, my trophies. Now let's just, hey, let's, my whole life is on. Everything is now on the pile. I count everything as loss. Why? Because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. This is very personal for Paul. He says, for knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, this knowing is not so much I know of you as I am in relationship with you. This is the relationship that Adam and Eve had. Adam knew Eve and had Cain, bore Cain. This is a personal relationship that, that now uh, Paul has received in Jesus Christ. And I love how he says that uh, knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord, uh, he's heightened it. He's just said in the Christ hymn that Jesus in ta- chapter 2 verse 10 has been given the name that is above every name and at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and that name is Lord. That name is Lord. So Jesus Christ is not only personal, he's my Lord. Everything now comes under Christ. Everything that I once held dear, I now seek after in Christ. He is now my personal Lord and Saviour. And we're going to look a bit more about this in a moment, but let's just keep moving. So Paul is not happy to leave the pile of stuff just sitting there, credentials and everything, as if like a dog to its own vomit, he could go back for it. He just throws it all under the bus In a shocking statement here in verse 8, he says, For his sake, that's Jesus, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Not only his religious credentials, not only everything, he viewed his status in community, his friends, his wealth, his, his position, he... He viewed it as nothing for the sake of Christ. In fact, now he looks at it and says, that is not only loss as if it's zero, this is actually a liability to me. If I trust in this, hold on to this, this keeps me from Christ. And so he says, I look at that and he uses a word, rubbish, could be described as dung, as feces. As refuse, not because it's bad, but because it's a liability that keeps me from Jesus. I don't want this in my sight anymore. This has to go because my, if my identity, my life is in these things, it stops me from the greatest thing, see, in Jesus. And so if that stops me, it is a liability to me and it needs to be put in the toilet and flushed and gotten rid of. And at this point, you may say, well, what's the big deal about Jesus? Like, is, is, is Paul going way overboard here? Like, come on. Like, surely, I, I, I like Christ. Yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, but do we need to throw everything on in with Christ? 
Do we need, do we have to leave everything? Do we have to place value only in Christ? Like, can't I just say, look, surely there potentially could be other ways to God. Surely I can have my sin and Jesus too, can't I? Why are you being so tough? Why, why throw all of my chips on one horse? You know, let, let's not be fanatical. Paul was fanatical, wasn't he? Paul now goes, so he's taken us to his balance sheet. He said, this is my credentials. He sees Jesus. All those credentials, credit goes as a debit for the sake of Jesus who now is his only credit, his only one. And now here he will come and explain to us, for those who are saying, do I need everything in Jesus? Well, now he'll explain to us why everything is found in Jesus and why all else really is loss compared to knowing Jesus Christ. So our third division is called, is Paul's surpassing wealth. What is it about Jesus that makes him worth more than this world and all its wealth and all its moralism and all its liberalism and all forms of self-fulfillment? Remember our point. Only those who truly know Christ recognize everything else as loss. The first thing is because there's a righteousness that is only found in Jesus Christ and nothing else. First thing is righteousness. Look at this, verse 9. He says, just before that, that I may gain Christ. Okay, what does it mean to gain Christ? Why is this important? And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Paul's striving was a striving to be made right with God. That's why he provides his credentials. Paul understood that he was a sinner. I'm sure he understood the sacrificial system. He understood that he needed to uh, seek forgiveness. He understood that I needed to be righteous. This is why he did all those things. No doubt he understood those things. He says in verse 9, a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. Uh, that's, that's a righteousness that, that you are seeking to be made right before God in your own strength. He says there's two righteousnesses here. There is one and you need one of them. Or you need righteousness before a holy God. We talked about God is holy. You need righteousness. There is one way of getting that and that's a righteousness through the law. Paul sought to do that. If I only do these things, then I'll meet God's standard. If I keep the law to the letter, the moral law, the ceremonial law. If I just keep that, then I'll be right. But then when he faced Jesus, what he found that by his moralistic keeping, there was actually a revealing of a pride in him, of a, of a, of a, a self-sufficiency, of in fact a moralism that didn't even reach to one inch to heaven that was required to come before God. He says that there is a righteousness that's, that's found in the law. The problem is none of us meet it. None of us meet it. For there is no one righteous, no, not one. See, if you have sinned once, you've disobeyed the law. And the thing about the law is, it's merciless. It doesn't care about you. If you disobey it, it demands blood. If, if say, and I use this in a um, uh, life group this week. Say your daughter gets... Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a mathematical equation. I'll make it extremely simple. One plus one, she, gets, she writes down three. She gets it wrong. She goes up to the teacher and says, please, look, I, one plus one, it's three, it's fine, isn't it? And she cries and cries. And the, the, the teacher has like, desires to give her mercy, but can't. She cannot say one plus one equals three. Why? Because it doesn't. No matter what she says, no matter what she does, it doesn't. So is the law to you. 
The law couldn't care if you're damned in hell. The law couldn't care if you cry and cry for mercy. The Lord, the law only wants what is right and will give you what is just. He says, there's a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. Do you want to go up against the law? If you sin once, you'll stand under the condemnation of the law. That's not the righteousness that we need. See, Martin Luther, as he was trying to find a righteousness that was found by the law, he saw that he could not meet it. In his groanings, in, his, in, his, in all his vigils, he could not meet it. It was a heavy demand on him. So where is this righteousness? It can't be found in myself for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Where is this righteousness I need? Well, let me just step back a minute. You might say, well, I'll just go to God and seek mercy because he's a loving God, isn't he? I'll just seek mercy. He'll forgive me. He'll just simply wipe the dead away because he's God. He can do anything. Do you know what you're asking God to do? Listen to Proverbs 17, 15. It says, he who justifies the wicked, he who makes the wicked right, he who calls the wicked righteous, and he who condemns the righteous are both alike an abomination for, before the Lord. What you're asking Jesus, God to do it, for you to get off scot-free is to become an abomination. The one who forgives justifies the wicked, calls the wicked righteous, is an abomination before God. So that you can go into heaven, that you can be right before God, you want him to be an abomination. It's not going to work. The Lord demands blood. There must be a, we need righteousness. Where is this righteousness? Paul saw, thought that he had the righteousness of God. This is a righteousness that is found outside ourselves. Martin Luther called it an alien righteousness. And where's it to be found? He says in 9. And be found in him. I want to gain Christ and be found in him. Not having, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. But that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. Jesus was the only righteous man. He did not sin. He was perfect in all his ways. He lived the righteous life that you have not lived. But he died, we know, on the cross. He died not for his own penalty, but for our penalties, for our sins. And he died to pay a debt I cannot pay. And he rose again uh, for God to affirm that it, that sacrifice has been received. And now it, Paul says that there is a righteousness of Jesus that is obtained by faith, by me placing my faith in him. Faith, the attitude whereby I abandon every hope of standing before God in my own effort. Every hope I abandon. That's what faith is. Oh, I trust in Jesus. No, 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 no. I have faith in Jesus alone to save me. Not my good works, not my talents, not my background, nothing else but Jesus. I humbly come before him. I have faith. Lord, save me. And guess what happens? There's a great exchange that occurs. His righteousness is granted to me. My sin was placed on him. I need a righteousness that's outside myself. So now when you say, what's the big deal about Christ? Why is he the only gain and everything else is lost? Because he's the only righteousness that we need. He's the only righteousness that we can have. That we can stand before God. This enters us into Christianity. This enters us into a relationship with him. And but we know, but then Paul would go on and say, this righteousness that you receive transforms our life now. This transforms our life. Let's look at it. The second thing, he says that I might receive that and that I might know him. Know him. Paul recognizes that I'm living in a sinful world that is going to be at my flesh. And the, the way I now, what I want to do, I see this pearl of greater price. I want to know him in such a personal way that I live for him, that I know what he expects and I live for him. I know him. He is my life. He is my desire. I become intimately involved in him. Jesus said that this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Salvation 
involves a personal, relational knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just knowing about him, but knowing him in relationship. Being intimately involved with him. Resting in his righteousness. Knowing that I can come to him with my burdens and my cares. He is now my life. He is my desire. I know he rules. I trust in him. Live for him. Fight my battles in his strength. Realize that all things come through his hand. I want to know him more and more. And we are going to know him through the scriptures. This is the transforming life. It's not that, see, sometimes we think if we just receive Christ, well, we, we can, we've got our ticket to heaven and then we'll just go to heaven. It's a whole transformation of life. I want to now know him. I want to know, now, I want to know the ruler of this world, the one who I live for, the one who has the best, my best desires at heart. There's an intense longing. Is your desire to know him? Are you in the word wanting him? Thirdly, so he, he, he sees Christ is my only treasure for he has a righteousness. Uh, he is the one I want to know. And then it says that I have a power that comes from him and I want to have the power of his resurrection. To know Christ and to be identified with Christ is to live for Christ. Um, I die to myself, I am raised again with Christ. I have new desires. But at the same time, I need, I need, I need resurrection power to live this life, don't I? Uh, Paul said in uh, Romans 7 that um, in his flesh he desires to do what's right, but doesn't have the power to do it. Where's the hope in this? The hope is when you turn to Christ. See, Christ not only gives us the grace that saves us, but gives us the grace that transforms us. I just know in my life when I came to Christ, there was a, there was a power, that, there, there was a change of desire to know him. There was a change of desire to know him, but then there was a power that was given to live for him. As I know him, I trust in him, and then I have this power to live for him. How evident this has been throughout my life. As I turn to him, his resurrection power is there with me. Well, I mean, this, is, this is freedom. You say Christ is slavery. No, this is freedom. Everything else is slavery that I'm trying to live for. Then he goes and says, number four, that I may share his sufferings becoming like him in death. He, Paul says he wants to share the sufferings of Christ. Why? Because he wants to be more like Christ. See, we want to run from our sufferings. Paul's saying, Actually, self-protection is a liability to me. Just catch that. Self-protection, if placed in the credit account, is a liability to me for Christ. How can that be? Because as we're seeking self-protection, we're not relying upon him. We're not receiving the strength to abide in him, to have faith in him, to have victories in him. And he says, I want to know Christ in such an intimate way that I want to, in a sense, share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, being intimately involved with him. And no other man or very few have experienced the persecution, the sufferings that Paul has experienced. And so what would that look like for us? It could look like so many things. It could, just, it could mean rejection, verbal abuse for the name of Christ, uh, di spiritual disappointments, frustrations. I share this, um, and don't take it the wrong way, but let me, let me try and explain it, and I'm sure you'll take it the right way. But as we were overseas, um, away from our home, um, I was praying to the Lord, and we were praying, Lord, what do you want us to do next? And, and seeking the Lord, and my prayer was, Lord, I'm... In one sense, now, let me, I'll caveat this so you'll be, you'll be all safe. I don't want to go back to Australia. There is a sense that I, when I am away from all the comforts, there's a closeness I have with you. I don't want to lose that. It's like I'm, I'm, I've been released from the, from the dock. And there's a deep comfort with Christ in the suffering, and I hate to even use that as suffering. Don't Lord, if, if, you, if there's any way, keep that close. 
And then, praise the Lord that he, op- that he closed all other doors, opened this door to come back. And let me just say, though, that it, doesn't, it hasn't taken me to be out of the country to experience that, that deep closeness with him because I'm experiencing it with you now. But I, I just want to just simply say that I was fearing of losing it. I don't want to hold on to this world. I don't want to, I don't want to root myself down because I want to be close with him. Whether it be sufferings, um, disappointments, temptations of Satan, I want to be close to you because in these times I am. And we could not be any more happy than being here, believe me. But just simply to say that, and Paul's saying, you are the only credit I have and I want to know you more deeply and please save me from trusting in anything else. Is that your prayer? And then he goes to the last one. He talks about our glorification. So we've done justification, the sanctification of our life, and then the glorification to be like Christ. He says that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. How did Paul know this resurrection? Well, he had seen Jesus' resurrected body, didn't he? On the road to Damascus, Jesus is resurrected. He had heard, potentially seen, probably heard about Christ's die, death. Now Jesus has a resurrected body and he says that by my trust and following after you as my only credit, I want to attain the resurrection from the dead. And he's not saying, don't get him wrong, by any means as if he is um, tempted to believe he won't receive it as it is a humility, Lord, I want to receive this. God, I press on, I want to receive this resurrection from the dead. He passionately, he passionately sought the a closeness with Christ in the sufferings of Christ, being like Christ in his death, but longing to be like Christ in his resurrection, to be with him for all eternity. This world was certainly not Paul's home, and he bore the scars of spiritual humility to prove it. This man was so in in love with Jesus, that everything for him was loss. What's the main point of the passage? Only those who know Christ recognize everything else as loss. Two questions. Question for those who don't know Christ. Well, the question is, no, question, do you know Christ? And then I'll, then I'll add another question. The question that Jesus said What will you give in exchange for your soul? What will you give in exchange for your soul? What he was saying there is, is what value do you place on your soul? If you place any value, you'll rest in Christ. If you don't place value, you will seek another path. Are you in Christ? Have you received his righteousness? There's no other way. There is a righteousness you need. It will not be found by the law. That will only damn you. You need the righteousness of Christ that he gives to you by faith, by abandoning every hope of resting on any crutch and resting only in Christ. And if you know Christ savingly, then are you now savouring him? Are you loving him? When you look at your balance sheet, is there anything in the credit area that is conflicting your love with Jesus? It's got to go. Christ will have no other. It's got to go. And ultimately, you will be frustrated. And so I ask you, is Christ your only greatest credit and is everything else counted as loss? There is only freedom and hope in Jesus Christ. May we seek after and gain him. Let's pray. Lord, now we thank you for the transformation that Paul speaks about that he saw Jesus, and when he saw Jesus, everything else fell away. Every hope, uh, every crutch, every other competing love. And Lord, I trust that everyone knows I am not saying you cannot do anything else, but everything else must be filtered firstly for my love for Jesus Christ, that he has to be our all in all. He has to be our greatest desire. And I pray for anyone who is conflicted. I pray for anyone who is sitting here 
believing that they can get to God by themselves, oh, awaken their soul, I pray, that they would receive the righteousness of Christ that is obtained through faith. And Lord, if there's anyone conflicted because they're placing their hope on anything else, their identity in anything else, their trust in anything else, Lord, I pray that they would seek after Christ, that they would seek after a knowledge of him, glorifying in him, uh, even the, through the sufferings, that they would value those, knowing that they are leading them closer and closer to, or deeper and deeper into relationship with Jesus. Uh, Lord, we thank you that you are our all in all. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.